Elizabeth Murray was born in Chicago and she studied at the School of the Art Institute in Chicago. And she studied there at a time when there were a lot of really interesting things happening in painting in particular in that city. She was around artists like Jim Nutt, artists who became very involved with the Harry Who and the Chicago Imagists, two groups of artists who are beginning to get a lot more exposure. There's been a lot of interest in their work over the last few years. And what they were interested in and what Elizabeth was surrounded with at that point was a new kind of figuration, a new kind of cartoon, almost realism. So these artists were very interested in the languages of comic books and they were developing a kind of graphic language within painting, which was very different to what was going on um, in Europe and in New York at that time. But actually then Elizabeth Murray moved to New York at the end of the 60s, and she, so she brought all of this with her. And she started to involve herself in the circles that were going on there at the end of the 60s. It was the sort of tail end, and you know, very much the tail end of abstract expressionism, but something of the scale and the very sort of expressionistic approach of those artists collided this kind of expressionistic abstraction with what she'd learned and what she'd been exposed to in Chicago. And of course, the other big thing was pop. So she was around artists like Andy Warhol and Klaus Oldenburg. I think she was really finding a, a very unique voice, a very ambitious painting style, which came out of both that kind of Chicago realism and the kind of New York abstraction and the pop. And when you put all of that together, you know, what emerges is a, is a very singular body of work. Everything kind of boils down into what she called art is an epiphany in a, in a coffee cup. The domesticality, these little simple objects that were surrounding herself in the studio, in her life, when she'd step out of the street in lower Manhattan and she'd hear a boombox in the 80s, the guy and the graffiti that she'd see on the subways and on the street. That really informed the nexus of what you're really seeing here. One of her biggest influences early on was a painting by Cezanne, and her teachers at the Art Institute of Chicago were teaching her how to analyze the painting. Look at this painting and see how it was structured, see how the composition, the lines, and what is he trying to say? What she was responding to was this tipped over, dumped over, oval-shaped basket with these apples tumbling out into space. And what she really realized at that moment was that the guy that was painting this was like a real human. Like, this is a real guy, clumsy, applying paint, figuring out what a composition looked like. And she attacked, drew herself to the humanity of the painting. The first painting that hasn't been seen uh, since it was made, really, is a painting called The Garage. It was painted in 1985. And it features a, one of her emblematic table compositions. She loved these domestic scenes. She loved these domestic scenes so much that critics called her a domestic woman artist. And she said, well, Cezanne, he painted you know, cups and saucers and tables and apples, and they never called him a domestic artist. Wake up, is this argy, argy bargy? Is that how you say it? Argy bargy? Ar yes, exactly. <laughs> coffee cup sort of tipping and turning on its side with the, its contents spilling out. In War and Peace also features a shattering table and three legs come out into the composition. Two of them are kind of almost like trying to embrace you. In the painting that's, that's right here, a Sandpaper Fate, uh, which is one of the most ambitious works, the last of this incredibly animated three-dimensional it comes in four pieces, has, uh, if you look closely, it has like a head and a, and a body, and it has two faces, and the head seems to be cracked open or blown open, so the, you know, the eye ideas and the mind is exploding, and then there's this empty hole in the chest where your heart might be. And then these weird feathered-like things that kind of come out and give the painting a nice warm hug. We always go back to the fact that these things are monsters and they're huge and they're climbing off the wall, they're multi-panels and they're complex. It's just been a remarkable experience to see these things alive. Many of them haven't been seen since they were made. So it's exciting to see them on view for the first time. It's also important to say that, you know, she is much better known in America. Her work was very little known in 
the UK and Europe. The reason for that is that the works are big, they're difficult to ship. So this exhibition at Camden is one of the only significant serious exhibitions she's had, not just in the UK, but in Europe, full stop. So I hope in one way for audiences in, in London, it's an opportunity to see and enjoy these incredible, like vibrant, um, exuberant works. But I also think that, that it's going to be quite inspiring, I hope, for another generation of artists.